Chapter 4, The Kids Are an Okay Audiobook, Clovis, on Kotev. Everyone likes me, but nobody understands me. Albert Einstein said that. It's Clovis Holmes' favorite quote. Except no one likes him. They just don't understand him. The only people who he had the closest relationship to was his best friend Finley. But she moved away a few months ago, so the only text occasionally. What makes matters worse is that she told him she got a boyfriend. So now they text even less. And that's really messed up his life plan. Clovis doesn't like things that interfere with his life plan. He had everything worked out. Graduate, go to MIT or Harvard, and become a biochemical engineer. If that doesn't work out, then he'll work at NASA for ground control. It was easy as that. Finley used to be in his life plan, but now that she's gone, he had to rewrite it. Clovis has begged his parents multiple times to homeschool him, to leave him in his basement and work on his machine and learn languages all by himself, but they couldn't possibly understand that the last thing he needed was social interactions. Clovis, come up here, his mother, Sophia, called from upstairs. Ugh, he groaned. He was working on his latest prototype, a homemade vacuum cleaner. It wasn't special, but he liked to tinker with machinery when not getting any ideas. His workspace was extremely disorganized. Bits and bolts were scattered everywhere, and sawdust coated the floor like a carpet. He had a headlamp over his other projects, and only had one bright one that Clovis rarely turned on. Clovis got up from his work desk and dragged himself upstairs. The kitchen was decorated like a stay-at-home mom's workplace. Embroidery on little patches was his mother's hobby, and so were little poems that she made when she was bored. She stuck them to the refrigerator, so there was something new every day before Clovis went to work or school. She had lighter hair than her son, which is always tucked behind her ear, and reached her shoulders. This time, her retro-pink polka-dotted dress wasn't accompanied with a bowl of lasagna. Instead, it matched his mother's crossed arms and a frown, which wasn't a good sign. I got a call from the postal worker, job. They said you didn't show up today. Where did you go, Clovis? Sophia asked, concerned. Clovis shoved his hands into his pockets. Nowhere, really. Nowhere? You just wandered around? She asked. I went to the library, too. Then the museum? He admitted. His mother sighed. Clovis's father, John, had entered the kitchen with a cup of coffee and his usual large coat. He always puts on a kitchen chair instead of the coat rack near the door. "'What's going on?' his father asked. "'Clovis skipped work today and instead went to the library.' His mother sighed. "'At least he did something productive,' John said. Miss Home turned sharply at her husband and glared melancholy. Mr. Home got the message. Uh, I mean, Mr. Holmes said, quickly changing his tone. That wasn't very responsible of you, Clovis. Are you kidding me? Clovis groaned. His part-time job as a mail carrier was boring. He walked around putting people's packages and mail at their doorsteps or mailboxes, and picking up parcels and doing the same thing all over again. He sometimes got to pet dogs while he was in the neighborhood, but even then their owners would start a conversation with them, and somehow he would show his odd side and they would get worded out. He doesn't understand. How can nobody care about the genius inventions of Nikola Tesla? Clovis, you can't skip work and go anywhere. It's your job, his mother said. It's not like I have anything to look forward to when I get there. Don't you have any friends or familiar co-workers? John asked, opening the refrigerator. No, Dad, Clovis said, rolling his eyes. No one wants to talk to me. That's not true, sweetie, Sophia said. Yes, it is, Clovis replied. He didn't really mind. Once he graduates, he'll never see this corrupt, trashy city ever again. Well, his father said, standing next to his wife with a bottle of Pepsi, there is something we'd like to tell you. Sit down. What's wrong? Clovis asked, sitting down at the dinner table. The tablecloth that covered the round table had blue flowers on it. His grandmother gave it to them for her attic filled with random junk. Clovis' parents looked at each other, and his father held Miss Holmes' hand. She looked at him and smiled. I'm pregnant, sweetie, she said. Her father grinned at him. Clovis didn't say anything. It's too early to tell what gender it's going to be, but we were thinking about names. I know since you like science and stuff, so if it's a boy, we'll name him Isaac, but if it's a girl, we'll name her Mary. What do you think? No! 
Clovis blurted out. His mother was stunned. What do you mean? Don't you not like the names? She asked. What? When did this happen? How could this happen? Clovis asked, ruffling his hair. This would mess up his life plan. Big time. Now he has to take care of babysitting. They'll mess up his workspace, get into his stuff, constantly distract him. He felt his heart beating faster and faster. Sweetheart, his mother said, putting her hand to on his head. This will be great. Clovis, his father stated, but Clovis stood up suddenly. I just, I need to get some air. I'll be back. Clovis stammered. He left the kitchen and took his jacket with a faux collar and left the house. It was dark outside, and the light from the streetlight was the only thing that lit up the sidewalk. The sky was like a blanket of darkness in the sky, and Clovis could see his breath on this chilly night. He refused to think about the baby. It would just make him panic. Clovis thought he was outside for about 15 minutes. It was getting colder and colder. But he didn't want to go back home, or else he'd have to face the fact that his life plan is going to have to be adjusted. Again. Clovis was too deep in his own thoughts to see the car pull the sidewalk of the park. It was dark, and the car didn't have its headlights on. He kept walking, and before he knew it, the sides of the black van opened up, and an arm pulled Clovis's shirt. He gasped a rag that reeked with the stench of chloroform covered his mouth and nose. Don't breathe in, don't breathe in. Clovis repeated in his mind. Maybe if he pretended to knock out, they would loosen their grip and he could escape. Still holding his breath, Clovis went limp. As he predicted, the man let go of him. Almost instantly, Clovis turned right and shook the man off him. Unfortunately, he was caught once more. Let me go! He screamed. As loud as he could, hoping one of his neighbors would hear him. He felt the man lift him up and slam him onto the ground. He looked to the sky from the ground, the streetlight blinding him and a large fist collided with his face. His eyes rolled back of his head, and the throbbing pain allowed his eyes to grow heavy, and he was successfully knocked out. End of chapter four.